Hello. Thank you so much for joining us as we launch our 20, fall 2020 issue of Yellow Arrow Journal, the reformation issue. My name is Anne Quinn. I'm the poetry editor for the journal and for our poetry chat books. And I also teach a series of poetry classes for Yellow Arrow called A Year in Poetry. Yellow Arrow Publishing makes an impact by providing opportunities and inspiration to the wonderful, vibrant voices of women in our community. In our classes, workshops, and publications, we allow women to express themselves however they come to us by creating a safe space to be proud of their work, lives, and stories. This you will see and hear in this edition of our journal. The journal is a result of hundreds of hours of work, both by our writers and by our staff led by Kapua Yao and assisted by many volunteers. I'm gonna screen share the cover of our journal. The cover that Jeannie Quinn designed is a beautiful encapsulation of our theme. In her words, lace, as a subject reveals something about the theme of reformation in referencing creation and destruction, sex and death. If you think about how lace is used historically and how it takes a line and turns it into form. Making a drawing of lace takes it from the realm of matter into that of an image, dematerializing this labored textile. So a line has been reformed into lace, which has been reformed into this image, which graces the cover of our journal. And I'm going to read the poem that we chose to open this issue of the journal. Listen for what a poem can do. Pains by Priscilla Freak. The poem arrives with its own blueprint, its own lumber and hardware. It has to. It's only a window built out of words, only part of a wall. It has to construct itself out of solid brick and vague dissatisfaction. The poem is not a bay window or a set of French doors but a narrow view sliced from a dormer. The distant hills wobble as I look through its wavering pane to where lights are troweled along the horizon, scraped over textured grass. The poem opens to this light and stays open long after darkness has fallen. And now please enjoy our other writers. I will let them introduce themselves. Sand. Surrender, they say. Accept your impermanence. Names hold no weight when you are designated to return to dust. Why the waves are pulled back to the sea. My toes gently slip into the warm grains of sand enfolding perfectly around my foot before engulfing it completely. My dad used to always take my siblings and me to the beach at least once a year. We have family in Clearwater Beach, Florida, and one summer we stayed with them for a week. My dad, myself, my little brother Ty, and my older sister Janelle would race each other to see who could get to the water first. We'd jump over the waves, body surf, or sit on the shore and let the waves crash on top of us. Sometimes we'd plant our feet in the sand with our backs to the ocean and feel like we were moving backwards as the wave broke, stretching as far as it could towards the shore before rushing back towards the sea. It wasn't until I'd gotten older that I realized that the water was being pulled back from where it came from. If anything, the sea has taught me that you must always return home. What the sand has taught me about letting go. Ashes are the only remains left of your previous form. And one day, Dad, we will set you free. 
Spread your ashes across the clearest water we can find, and I will whisper, you are untethered, dead. I am still not fully sure how to be at peace with letting you go, but I remind myself that there will always be remnants and pieces of you. When I was researching sand, I searched through multiple definitions online, and one thought seemed to really resonate throughout. Sand is a non-renewable resource over many, many human time scales. Sand is made up of tiny pieces of rock and other materials weathered down by wind and other forces. However, it is the fact that sand is non-renewable, that each tiny piece can't be recreated, that each piece remains bound to some previous identity, some previous form, whether it be quartz or some other rock or mineral. A grain of sand is always tethered to its past life. The sand comforts me by showing me that there will always be eternal guides that remind us of where we come from, that there is no one form possible to stay in permanently. So that is how I will find comfort in letting you go. The sand reminds me that there are compositions, imperishable histories that will always align our stories together. I'm Uta Carson. I live with my husband in Austin, Texas. We have three daughters, six grandchildren, a horse, and many cats. I'm 80 years old, and that can tell you much about me. The inspiration for my poem arose from my belief that we need to learn to live with aging, especially old age, but that we should not be enslaved by it. Here is my poem. Whisks around each corner. Nothing can be taken for granted when you are 80. There is risk wherever you turn. My doctor's warning echoes as I leave the clinic. Even well-oiled hinges are beginning to creak. My heart is skipping a beat and my feet burn at night. Getting through an ordinary day saps my energy. I'm drained after even a leisurely walk. But should I stop dancing because I fear a fall? Should I leave off lovemaking lest pleasure stop my heart? No longer climb a little higher because I'm short of breath? Now in old age, I pay for excesses of joy with mounting aches and pains. But rekindling the thrill of cherished skills still seems worth it, all in all. By staying connected through breath and touch, we delay the long sleep that awaits us all. I have resolved to take risks while I'm still able to savor life's sweet nectars. There's a song from the 80s. If you want to sing out, sing out. If you want to be free, be free. There are a million ways to be, and a million ways to be 80. Hi, my name is Meg Crane, and I am so excited to have my poem, Topsoil, um, published in the latest edition of Yellow Arrow Journal. Um, the inspiration behind my poem had a lot to do with Reformation, specifically what the synonym I chose of renewal. Um, every winter, personally, is usually a bit harder for me than the warmer months, so to speak. I find that the shortened days, it getting darker earlier, um, I really have to put a lot more effort into being happy or finding the reasons to you know, put in that little bit of oomph to get up in the morning to do the things I need to do. And I, I know I'm not the only person out there who feels like this. Um, as someone who suffers from uh, mental health problems, um, one of millions and millions of people around the world who also do, um, I think my protagonist, as all of these people and myself, we have to make the conscious choice every winter to renew ourselves every moment, every second, every day. It's about waking up and saying, I'm here, 
I might not feel like doing this, things might be really hard right now, but I know there's, you know, a light at the end of this tunnel. And even more so making that choice that things kind of suck right now, but I'm going to try to find the good in them. So I am so excited to be able to have my words be a part of this bigger theme of reformation along with so many talented authors and writers. Um, so I hope you enjoy my piece, Topsoil. I used to think I was damned to the seasons, a frail bone Persephone, hands stained with pomegranate pills, last spring's diagnoses fluttering in my stomach with every shortened day. I used to think I was doomed to hide and hibernate, six feet under a temporary death, and each spring I'd claw my way through the rubble of winter to heal my bleeding fingernails in the brighter months. Now, I think, maybe, I might be an evergreen. Now, I think, maybe, that barren winter earth could be the perfect place to plant my roots. Now, I think, maybe, these darker nights are just a chance to see the stars a little longer. Yes, this light is thin, but it is still sunshine. Yes, these times are tough, but we are still growing. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed my piece. My name is Sarah Eiler. I live in Blacksburg, Virginia, and this is my poem called Acorn. It's a poem about formation, self-discovery, and personal growth. She told them her dreams, and they offered cheap alternatives they thought she could afford. Certain of her smallness, they saw at first hand, painted as wrinkles of self-doubt across her face. She received proper baptism, in condescension oozing invisibly from their eyes. And although she didn't buy their discounted dreams, more than ever, she too was certain of her smallness. But then she grew, unexpectedly and ever so little by little, the way an acorn reveals itself, a sprawling oak, only after earning time, ring by ring. The result may be as surprising to the acorn as anyone else. And although they didn't think much of her by looking at the seed, which they mistook for flowering finality, she grew anyway. My name is Bailey Drum from Baltimore, Maryland, and I wrote the book review Evolve Until the End on Michelle Obama's book, Becoming, for the Reformation volume of the Yellow Arrow Journal. This memoir was even more relevant than I could have initially anticipated when I chose this book. Michelle's been a daughter, a wife, an attorney, a first lady, an author, but at the end of the day, she drives home that being genuine to yourself is truly your best form. She navigates the reader through the benefits of being true to yourself by splitting the book into three sections that show her journey up into becoming the woman that she is today. Becoming me, becoming us, and becoming more. Becoming me is based on Michelle's early years, her childhood, her family, her interests growing up, her initial direction in life, her career goals, and so on, leading up to being assigned as a mentor to Barack at a law firm that they had worked at. Becoming Us covers their budding relationship and the transition into starting a family and the changes that come with that. As she became a wife and a mother, she grew and her perspectives changed and she recognized that that was okay. There were sacrifices that needed to be made and her freedom needed to bend a little bit in order to work as a team with Barack. She's very candid about the struggles that it took to reform herself while also holding true to her core values. And this section covers up until Barack's inauguration. Becoming More covers Barack's time in office and how Michelle approached the task of becoming first lady. She found a way to morph her beliefs into tangible changes that she could implement in our country, along with addressing that our world is constantly changing around us and we need to be able to change with it. To end with a strong quote that emphasizes her point, becoming isn't about arriving somewhere or achieving a certain aim. I see it instead as a forward motion, a means of evolving, a way to reach continuously forward to a better self. The journey doesn't end. In other words, never stop changing to continue to be true to your genuine self. Never stop reforming. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Nikita Sharma and um, I just want to tell a little bit about myself before I read the poem. Um, so, I am originally from Kathmandu, Nepal, and I have lived in the U.S. for the last eight years. 
currently in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I work at a mental health nonprofit uh, and I really love it. I work as a program coordinator there. <clears throat> and for me, writing for the past few years has just been writing in my head. But lately I've been trying to bring it to life as a poem on paper so it can make its way to places like the Yellow Arrow Journal. Um, and the poem I'm going to be reading today is titled Be You Beautiful um, and here it goes. Have you ever wondered what would happen if the sun ever doubted itself? On days it didn't shine as bright? What if the moon felt shattered? On nights it didn't light up the whole sky? Would they ever come back? If they spent their time blaming the clouds for getting in the way? What if the mountains never wanted to take up space? And the flowers didn't see the point in blooming fully? What if rivers and oceans decided not to flow? and the flowers thought their singing wasn't worth listening to. But have you ever also wondered, darling, what would happen if like the sun you rose, if like the mountains you stood tall, if like the river you flowed wholeheartedly, undoubtedly? Thank you. Um, so, I wrote this poem as a letter to myself to challenge myself to think in newer ways and to be braver. And um, that's why I think the theme reformation spoke um, so much to me. Because usually when I'm, whenever I'm trying to do something new, uh, whether it's driving to a new location, talking to a new person, or whatever challenging, the first feeling that I get is that of self-doubt um, and I'm trying to change it towards just believing that I can do it and just getting that done because I deserve to take up space and um, I just deserve to think, do things that my heart tells me to do. Um, and that's about it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Katie Mitchell. I'm a writer in suburban Atlanta, Georgia. I have a nonfiction piece entitled Stereotactic in the latest issue of Yellow Arrow Journal. And I'm excited to be a part of this virtual reading. I wrote this two years ago when I had a health scare at the same time as a messy breakup, at the same time as the Kavanaugh hearings were unfolding on television. And it seemed as though every vulnerability was um, sort of being bruised at once, both physical an emotional, individual, and collective. Um, and I, I sat down to write about it and put the pieces together. It fits with the theme of reforming yourself uh, when we move past these experiences and challenges and the ways that vulnerability can change us. When we put the narrative together and we put ourselves uh, together in different pieces, reform ourselves on the other side. Since it's an essay, um, I can only read a uh, part of it, but I'm happy to read the first bit for you today. Now hold your breath, the radiologist instructs as the machine hums. I dutifully follow her command, clenching my jaw as I pause mid exhale. I listen to her mumble numbers and terms to the technician, talking about my body in words I cannot understand. This is a stereotactic biopsy I'd learned. Under the guidance of a mammogram machine, they are using a needle to extract a portion of my breast and then placing a tiny titanium pin inside of me to mark the spot. I am face down and shirtless in a sterile hospital room with my head craned sharply to the right where I stare at the blank wall. My bare breast is hanging through a hole in the table, dangling over the head of the radiologist seated below. I wonder what it looks like, my small B cup shape hanging down like that, a sharply pointed triangle hovering above her. Only men have seen this view before looking up at me in our most intimate moments, not in a brightly lit and sterile place. I keep my focus on the blank wall, motionless, listening to them call out unknown coordinates and medical terms. This journey all began two months ago with a simple baseline mammogram. You're 37, my midwife asked as she flipped through my chart at my annual appointment. We usually suggest a baseline image now so that we have something to compare it to later. 
I scheduled an appointment later that week. I found myself wrapped in a pink robe, walking down a long hallway and into a small room where I stripped the robe off and stood still for the coal machines to squeeze and flatten each side. I held my breath until they told me to exhale, and then I got dressed and left. Days later, the clinic called back to explain they needed another image to see through the dense tissue. I obliged, by now an expert at stilling my breath for the machines. Then another call came, insisting on a biopsy to check a concerning spot very far beneath what I could feel with my own hands. I repeated the terms to myself, young, no family history, and rolled my eyes at the over-precaution of modern medicine. But even though I tried, I could not forget the clipped way the doctor had said the ways biopsy and concerning. Hey folks, my name's Anna Nisley, and I'm one of the poets featured in this issue of Yellow Arrow. I'm originally from Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, which is a small town in South Central Pennsylvania. This poem came about um, because of my background as a hiker and a backpacker and someone who identifies as a woman. So I'll give you a little bit of background. For a few years of my life, I have been hiking and backpacking, and even though I'm just 23, I now have some significant experience under my belt in those areas. But um, it hasn't always been the kind of ideal idea of just going out into nature and enjoying yourself. And part of that is because of my gender identity, as well as my physical body. I um, originally started thinking that going outdoors and hiking and backpacking could be a release and could kind of be a way to escape what I wish wasn't a part of society and I, that I wish um, I didn't have to struggle with in society. So as a way to escape this idea of sexism and the misogyny that women can face in everyday life. But unfortunately, going outdoors really doesn't help you escape completely because the areas where I go, mainly the Appalachian Trail, isn't free from people who carry those same aspects of misogyny. And unfortunately, sometimes the misogyny lives within myself, right, in within my own head. Um, this poem is really a tribute for me to not only where I come from as somebody who has internalized sexism and has to continue to fight that in my own experiences every day, um, the messages that I tell myself, but also a tribute to the changes that I've undergone over the years as I've become emboldened and continued to go outside even though I've received messages growing up that I'm not really supposed to be alone as a woman and that I'm supposed to kind of be protected and guarded by a man. Um, these changes aren't over and I anticipate that the more I hike and backpack, the better I'm going to feel and the more at home I'll feel in my own skin and in the outdoors. I hope you enjoy it. My poem is called On Hiking Alone as a Woman. To escape isn't looking over your shoulder. It's not holding your breath. It's not wondering whether the steps behind you are getting louder. Healing isn't envisioning 50 ways to kick and scream. Healing doesn't live in suggestions to bring a friend. To heal is a privilege. To escape is a dream. I stand on the furthest rock, jutting chin and belief of belonging into the air to make them true. Thank you. My name's Katie Murray. I'm from Nottingham in the UK. The theme of reformation or reforming yourself after trauma particularly resonated with me. And this is an extract from my piece called The Timidity of Human Toes. It's narrated by a waterfall and it's an encounter between a waterfall and a woman that goes there to seek counsel and she takes advice from the waterfall about how to move on and reform. Ah, she's one of those humans. Our favourite kind, always seeking counsel from water. It doesn't matter if it's the roaring sea, the roiling river or the mill pond lake. Water soothes something deep within her. It is palpable. Each step is careful. We feel a lightness in the spring of her toes and glimmer appreciatively. Craggy rocks, black and green, and all the ferns in between urge her on. The pressure of us all surges against the back of her heels, naked ankles still a storm as impatient water reforms its own path. The impetuous rush over once ragged rocks, down, 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 always down. Where else is there? Moments crack open and reveal their truth. The top is daunting, it is beautiful. 
She cocks her head and we know she will listen. Feel it all we urge, the rush and the sadness, the loneliness and the doubt, be it all, the beauty and the love, the brutality and the fear. Mayhem and wonder, inexplicable loss and unbounded growth, feel it all. Our power only swells with more water, with more stones and rocks in our path, like you. Nothing can stop you. Just make sure you feel it all. And feel the anger, the white-tipped sorrow and the roiling loss. Feel it all. Joy, loneliness, the craggy bones of bitter discontent only you can feel. Particles of hope, sunshine behind your eyelids, every shade and whisper of green. Other people's bones when you hold them, warm limbs, your small hands, your throat opening like a starling at dusk, unafraid and complete. As moments crack open, sit inside them. Be the bone dragging weariness and the flash of life in your very own eyes. Forgive yourself. Forgive the world for breaking you. Forgive yourself for holding on to the feelings you do not need. We are always here, always, just not ever the same. We are shifting and streaming, never the same, from one moment to the next. Nothing forgives like water. Writers are not just people who sit down and write. They hazard themselves. Every time I compose a novel, my composition of myself is at stake. I'm paraphrasing E.L. Doctorow, but these words speak to the heart of this Reformation theme for me. Saubona, that's Zulu for hello. It also means, I see you. I'm Kishni Naika Washington. My stories are influenced by the two continents that I call home. I was born across the Atlantic in an apartheid segregated township called Chatsworth in Durban, South Africa. But I've spent about eight years in DC now, and I also consider this my home. I'm a Vona alum, and I host the Signal Fire series podcast. Since I was a little girl, I would gaze at the stars and wonder about far off worlds. This nurtured a love of science fiction and astronomy, but today's piece is a nonfiction, and it's about everyday life. But it is a hat tip to that little girl. It's called Alien, and it speaks to reformation, and reclamation. I believe we are formed by the environment around us, but we can reclaim our truths by the decisions we make every day. So here's a snippet. Airpods inserted, mask adjusted, hands sheathed in blue disposable gloves. After ascending from the underground parking, I launch off the escalator and into the local Safeway as an astronaut would. My solo mission today is to seek out and acquire missing dinner supplies. I pause and scan the environment right away for obstacles and interceptions. With my path calculations complete, I stride with care. I imagine the digital trail that would be illuminated in, my, in bright blue dots if I had on an astronaut visor. No artificial intelligence illuminates my prescription lenses in the tortoiseshell frames that rest on my nose from Wabi Parker. A few strides ahead, a local halts with no prior warning. He hovers an indecision and blocks off the entrance to the cereal aisle. My next destination, evasive maneuvers are deployed with success and I veer wide and pass. The fine hairs of my forearms rise as I enter the frozen straits of the refrigerated and fresh produce island. I locate and collect my samples. Cheese and margarine are plucked from a wall of illuminated choices. I find limes, bananas, and cucumbers. An island covered in mounds of orange spheres draws me in, as if I am caught in a tractor beam. Am I seeing correctly? I reach out blue fingers and unfold the tag. Cara Cara oranges, all the way from South Africa, all the way from home. Memories squeeze my heart as I haul the sack into the basket. You can read the rest of this in the fall edition of Yellow Arrow Journal. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Biles and I currently live in Washington, DC. The theme of reformation resonates with me because I am continuously reminded as I go through life that we are forever forming and reforming, and that's how it's meant to be. 
We are ever-changing, each and every one of us, shaped by those we share our lives with, by those we love, by those we lose, by those we know and hold in our lives forever, and by complete strangers, those we may meet for only half a second. All can influence our ongoing formation and reformation. The poem I will read, for me, has its roots in reformation, in renewal, in the pulling back of the curtains to let in the light. It speaks to the ways that we as humans change one another. In this case, how the fearlessness in the body of a lover can reveal a path, a way of existence that only seconds before was quite simply hidden. And it seeks to remind us that people are only people through other people. That is the essence of humanity, and it's a beautiful thing. And now, fearless. You look out the window naked, morning light flooding through the chasm created by your pulling back of the curtains. Your body is fearless. I wonder if you make it a habit of pulling back curtains, of letting in the light. We are deep here together. We may get lost, but stretching into every corner the light reaches, and you are there showing me that the sum of all my flaws is beauty, is sunrise on skin, is skin freed from clothing's confines, is your fearless body illuminated by the light of day, is mine. Thank you. Hello, my name is Paulina Friedman. I'm a poet and writer from the North suburbs of Chicago. My poem is called Sanctuary and I see it falling more into the category of formation rather than reformation. It tells the story of a young girl discovering her inner strength and coming into her own power. Sanctuary. A small girl cowers alone. No one ever sees her cry in the cave that's all her own. An owl hoots a calming tone, the one that she is guarded by while she hides out all alone. Surrounded by sand and stone and winged birds, a girl can fly around the shelter all her own. Out of truth, she carves her throne, for no one ever tells a lie to the quiet girl who endures alone. With silk and strength, she weaves her gown, a glint of magic in her eye, in the sanctuary all her own. Moonlight melts into her bones. Even the stars don't dare defy the steadfast girl who shines alone in a kingdom all her own. Hello, I'm Amy Bernstein from Baltimore, Maryland, and my piece is on the theme of reformation because it is very much about the need to rethink how we think about race in the United States. A walk in the park. I drag my old white body wherever, the park, prettified specifically for me, neat asphalt trails, thick stands of white oak and holly, shafting sunlight, picnic tables, pavilions, and no black bodies here today, between Locust Cove and the Chesapeake Bay. Long before me, the parkland belonged to Mr. T, his beloved rocky beach and enclave of private pleasure palaces and boat slips. Mr. T of the Baltimore Leaf Tobacco Association, of barns, granaries, water and electric plants, of four private country clubs where surely there were black bodies aplenty. Before that, Mr. T's daddy stood with General Loring in the Romney expedition under Stonewall Jackson, Oh, but keep in mind, Mr. T received a gold medal for rescuing a partially blind colored woman who fell off a steamboat on the Rappahannock in 1900, highlight of his obituary. Before that, Charles Carroll, signer on to, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, bought the land of which the park is but a speck. Before that, Enslaved black bodies moved logs from Bodkin Creek to Locust Cove to the bay for commerce and convenience. Before that, Patuxent and Piscataway indigenous villagers sharpened their spears on the fishing grounds of the cove's V-shaped canal. I drag my old white body wherever, wending, wending the park's genteel walkways, sculpted to pleasure me on a warm summer day, and there are no black bodies here today to remind me of where I really am and who is really here and to whom I am owing.
Hello everyone, I am Colleen Anderson and I live in the west coast of Canada in Vancouver, British Columbia. I will be reading the poem Phoenix, which is about reformation. As a writer and like many writers, you can write many pieces, but not all of them will sell and sometimes the rejections can pile up. In fact, anyone who cannot take the grief of rejection probably shouldn't be a writer. But Sometimes you do carry on, and this poem is really about continuance. Phoenix. I am burning all my poems. The embers will glow for years, just as I, once fueled with words. When the pit is cold, I will take the ashes, rub them in, re-anoint my flesh, wait for the phrases to rise again. Thank you very much, everyone. I would like to thank all of tonight's readers and to thank you for listening. Please purchase a copy of the journal from our website, yellowarrowpublishing.com, or from most other major distributors. Thanks again.